Are we though? No. It's a real debate. Can't they? Are you sure? <laughs> All right. We come here for the big questions. The big questions is like, <laughs> can we trust technology? That is the big question. And the answer to that is no, not at all. Uh, how's everyone doing? Great. Not bad. It's a little chilly here. <clears throat> yeah. Um, the swing from 43 this past summer to neg 15 right now has been a little bit harsh. Yeah. Translation for the American audience, 120 degrees down to zero. Yeah, negative, negative 15 is is not right. You must be joking about 40, 43 Celsius. I, uh, no, I believe that's about 120. In, in Alberta? Yeah, we, no, 
I was in Arizona. In Arizona, okay. Uh, See, well, okay. Wait, my wait, wait, wife and I are doing a holiday road trip up to visit her family. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, 39? I'm trying to remember what we hit. Five? No, we hit 30. No, that's right. We hit. We were up into the 40. We hit 40 last summer. Okay. Yeah, in British Columbia, which normally we won't go beyond, say, 24 in the summertime. So it was ludicrous. Just unbelievable like vancouver islanders just didn't know what to do and the other places just got even hotter and then lit on fire and then the rain two came summers ago and slides two summers ago in phoenix we hit a couple of new records like 100 days over 100 and 50 days over 110 oh. one summer oh yeah yay yay yeah <laughs> hashtag new to town yeah yeah, well, I mean, the part that here it's weird is nobody has air conditioning, so. Well, most we of the time you don't need it. No, no. Heat, we, yes. Yeah, air conditioning, meh. That's a, really just an umbrella. If you have an umbrella, you've got <laughs> most of your weather issues sorted out here. But, oh man! Yeah. See, you've got it better than Seattle. When I lived in Seattle, anyone with an umbrella you knew was from out of town because the moment it's really raining and you want the umbrella, it inverts itself and flies away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. The wind isn't so bad here. It's but the rain is. I mean, like we are rainier than Seattle. Seattle is adorable when they say that they get a lot of rain. And the and the hilarious thing is, people farther up the island and farther up British Columbia get rain that just puts us to shame. We can't even wrap your head around how much rain can fall in some of the places. That's fair. But when I lived in Seattle, we set a new record for forty six days where it didn't stop raining. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. We get that. Not, not even a good rain, just drizzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. How far north do you have to go in British Columbia before it snows a lot? Um. Well, it's 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 just if close to the ocean, then it's not bad. So okay. if you go inland, like if you go over the mountains into the interior of British Columbia, then you get quite a bit of snow, and the temperatures drop to say minus twenty, minus twenty five in the, okay. the winter time. But okay. here on the coast. Yeah, well, yeah. So Pamela is saying that we also get bears. It's true. We get bears and, and cougars. I've got, uh, there's like a cougar and two babies sort of in our neighborhood. And people are spotting them every every couple of days. And my buddy nice. just got, yeah, my buddy just got punished for leaving some garbage outside by a bear tearing his garbage. It went through his door to get to his garbage to uh to enjoy it so yeah you learned a you learned a valuable life lesson there which is like don't put your garbage in your in your uh i don't know it's like a foyer kind of thing yeah and we've had a bear get drunk uh our neighbor had a tree and they had a bunch <laughs> of uh rotting pears on the tree and a bear got into it and and, and got pretty drunk and then passed out <laughs> under their tree mm. yeah yeah we wildlife is a concern here but it's not that bad, you know. I don't know. Every time I hear about one of these headlines from Canada, it's just adorable. Yeah, we had a problem. The bears got drunk and broke into our house and ate our garbage. Yeah. Oh, our prime minister bought the wrong donuts. Oh, the guards were skimming from the maple syrup strategic reserve. Which is a <sighs> thing. I yeah. miss Canadian politics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we uh, we keep pretty low key up here. Uh, all right. Well, we've reached the uh, five minute ish mark, so I think we'll go to the actual show. So, uh, oh, I'll do one more thing. Oops. I wanted to watch the show chat. Uh, okay. See, Fraser, if you hadn't curtailed the conversation, we could have hidden that you were still doing technical things in the background. It's true. I, I'm, well, I mean, the, the bottom line is that Pamela has taken over so much of this that that now I don't even know how to do anything anymore. I'm just like my my <laughs> engineering technical ability is just atrophied to the point that I just I just have to show up. I can I can do this whole show with my hands up now. It's amazing. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get into it. 
Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, December 15th, 2021. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about giant exoplanets, uh, water on Mars, and uh, how quickly the moon cooled. There's a lot of AGU stuff coming at you this week. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, Moya, what's going on? It's not feeling well. We've got uh, replacements all around. We got uh, Nick for this the third week in a row. Nick, welcome back. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's yeah, starting have, to feel familiar. Yeah, yeah. You're a you're a, you'll you'll be able to turn pro. You're catching up to the rest of the of the veterans uh, very quickly. Uh, we've got Alan Versfield. Hey, Alan. Hey, nice to be back. Yeah. Good to have you back. All right. So before we get into this week's episode, I just want to give a huge thank you and a reminder that you should go and join the incredible Weekly Space Hangout crew. These are our friends, our fans, our executive producers. There are guests out there that you want to bring on the show. If there are people who have written books and you want us to talk to them, uh, you can do this. We don't. You do. The executive producers, you call the shots. So go to the incredible Weekly Space Hangout crew community, wshcrew.space. They'll give you all the instructions and information that you need to wield ultimate cosmic power. All right. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Paul Halpern. Dr. Halpern, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Hi. Thank you, Fraser. Great to be here. All right. The question I always ask people, who are you? what do you do? Well, I'm a professor of physics at the University of the Sciences, and I'm also a science writer. I've written 17 popular science books wow. over the years. My latest is Flashes of Creation. 17 that's that's just pathological at this point like, <laughs> you know like, like i've i've written a couple of books and i will never write another one and i think that's you know you go through one and you, you're all enthusiastic you write your first book but it's really very special if a person gets their second book that that's a certain level of, of masochism i think um so i you I, I got a chance to read Flashes of Creation. Uh, super fun. It was a wonderful history, soup to nuts, of the Big Bang Theory, but also really the interplay between two really important scientists. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, the title of the book is, a, is kind of a play on words because Flashes of Creation is about the competing theories of how matter in the universe came about. One of the scientist George Gamow thought that everything came about in a big bang and the other Fred Hoyle thought that matter trickled in slowly small flashes of creation and also the title represents the idea that these two scientists had incredible insights they just had these sudden ideas and they went with it they were a little bit impulsive and they would think of something and then go with it and stick with it until they could explore it further so and how much did these two play off each other and and interact as these two camps really got set up well interestingly enough both of them were really adept at playing the media that using the mass media so they both were involved in radio television uh popular culture they kind of grew up in the Hollywood era, so they sort of had this idea that they were, in some sense, movie stars or larger-than-life personas. In terms of actual interactions, I found that they met up in, uh, in 1956. Um, Gamov was working in San Diego. He was doing some military consulting, and he invited Fred Hoyle, who was working at Caltech doing research, to come down, and they drove around in Gamov's white Cadillac and talked about astrophysics and talked about the temperature of the universe and stuff like that. So they didn't interact in person very much, but they interacted in the pages of popular science magazines such as Scientific American. They interacted by their ongoing radio dialogue and also publishing mass paperback books. And it's interesting to me, like like Hoyle was the one who actually coined the term Big Bang and and not kindly. Yes, he was on uh, BBC radio in 1949 and he was invited to do a program about cosmology. And the focus of that program was his idea that all of the matter in the universe trickles in very slowly over time, over the eons. And that 
is measurable, that you could kind of see this happen or try to measure this happening. And he thought that the idea that everything was created at one single point in the distant past was not only kind of strange, also something that you couldn't really measure, something that you could gauge. He thought it was taking the problem and sort of throwing it onto the carpet and saying, well, we're not going to deal with this now. We're going to place all the creation of matter in the distant past. So then on BBC radio, he called it the Big Bang in, in a slightly disparaging way. Um, <clears throat> and the other, the other thing that I found really interesting was like Hoyle, Gamow was right. Or, you know, to the best of our ability, that's what we can tell today. Hoyle was wrong, but both and many of the other people that were involved in this story were coming up with just incredible, as you say, flashes of, of insight, flashes of creation as they were developing these theories. And it's as if, like, I wonder how Hoyle would have been if he had, if he'd had his paradigm, if he changed his paradigm to accept the Big Bang as opposed to sticking to this idea of steady state. Well, Hoyle, um, his, his main contribution to astrophysics was the idea that all the elements, except for helium and hydrogen, were created in stars. And this is an area where George Gamow came up short because George Gamow and his assistants, uh, Ralph Alpher and Bob Herman, thought that all of the chemical elements could be created during the hot Big Bang. But it turns out that the Big Bang cools off very quickly and is not hot enough after the first few minutes to produce elements such as carbon and oxygen, in other words, the elements that we need to survive. And Hoyle said, you know, how can we exist without carbon? How could we exist without oxygen? There must be some way in nature to create that. And he came up with the idea of what's called the triple alpha process, that alpha particles or helium nuclei can come together during the contraction of dying stars, and that this contraction, as stars uh, lose their primary fuel of hydrogen and turn to other uh, fuels to try to keep themselves going, um, leads to ultra-high temperatures, temperatures much harder, hotter than the core of the sun, that can produce start producing all the chemical elements. And then the chemical elements that are not produced during the contraction phase are produced during the explosion of stars in what are called supernova explosions. And they produce all the rest of the chemical elements all the way up to uranium. So that was an absolutely brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. And Hoyle, I think Hoyle should have won the Nobel Prize for that. His, his colleague, uh, Willie Fowler, who did the experimental testing of the idea, won the Nobel Prize. But Hoyle uh, was excluded. And a lot of people think he should have won it with Willie Fowler who tested the idea won it. So so Hoyle was pretty successful himself. He wasn't just the person who came up with steady state and coined the term Big Bang. He came up with his own ideas too. And I wonder though, if ideas like that were necessary to help push the Big Bang theory ahead to provide kind of a counter to it to help search for, for inadequacies in the theory. Yeah, so the fact that there was competition challenged the Big Bang theorist to try to look for evidence for their theory. And uh, ultimately, that evidence came in the form of cosmic microwave background radiation that was accidentally discovered in 1964, 1965. And that vindicated the idea that the universe was once very hot. But until then, it was an open question whether the Big Bang Theory was right, or Hoyle's idea, which is called the steady state theory, was right. Hoyle's idea was that the matter trickled in slowly to the universe, and then as the galaxies move away from each other, new galaxies form in their place. So the universe is essentially eternal, that it looks pretty much the same over time. It's interesting, like, you know, because, again, we've been sort of steeped in modern cosmology, that seems ridiculous. But at the same time, like, doesn't the entire universe being, you know, the entire observable universe being incredibly dense and then expanding outward from there, and who knows where it came from, 
that's also pretty implausible <laughs> too. And yeah. yet the evidence is overwhelming that this, that this exists. So I can see why either idea was compelling. It was just a matter of, of lining up as much evidence as you could find for it. Yeah, well, the original proposer of the Big Bang idea was George Lamatra, who was a Belgian priest. And uh, later, the Pope uh, adopted the idea. The Pope at the time, Pope Pius, said, well, this is proof of Genesis. And Lamatra, even though he was a priest, said, hey, wait, hold on, wait a second. Um, this is not a religious idea. This is a scientific idea. But then his estimate and later estimates in the 1940s and 1950s of the age of the universe, according to the Big Bang Theory, was only 2 billion to 3 billion years old. And everybody knew that the oldest stars and Earth were much older than that. So the Big Bang Theory sort of didn't make sense because how could the universe be older, uh, younger than the oldest stars? But then later, new measurements of the age of the universe show that it, it is indeed um, almost 14 billion years old. So that explains how all the galaxies and stars and Earth itself were formed. So one of the really interesting mysteries, and I think this is a great example where if you've got a, a like the answer that you're expecting, a preconceived notion of, of where the evidence is going to take you, then you see something and you fit that into that pattern. So this idea of quasars were discovered back around that time. And talk a bit about how Hoyle incorporated that idea into his steady state well so quasars are these immense sources of energy and originally they, they were thought to be in the milky way itself because they were so bright they, they it was thought that they were very close but then martin schmidt proved that they were well beyond the milky way and in fact uh, billions of light years away so they must have been from the dawn of time from early, the early universe. So then people start to realize that quasars must be hot young galaxies information that are producing immense amounts of energy. Now, Hoyle decided once evidence was found for the Big Bang Theory, he wanted to still hold on to the idea of steady state. So he came up with the idea of little bangs. And he thought that, well, maybe the quasars are really something more recent and they're these immense sources of energy that are modern and they're producing uh, new energy, new matter. And that explains the universe, how the universe comes about without having to resort to an actual big bang. He called these little bangs and he tried to, right. um, you know, change the steady state theory to something called the quasi steady state theory. And he held on to that idea until his death in 2001, wow. even 19, 1998. He and his colleagues, uh, Jayant Narlikar and uh, Jeff Burbage, published a book on uh, this idea of the universe, the quasi steady state theory of the universe. And in the book, surprisingly enough, they pictured and uh, had a photo of geese following a mother goose. And the caption was, these are how Big Bang theorists act. They, they all follow each other without thinking about it. We're suggesting an alternative model of the universe. But I mean, it, it, even like at the time of his death in 2001, just a couple of years ago, we had W map, didn't we? Like 90. Oh, yeah. Like we had the Mo Kobe W map. We at this point, we had incredibly precise measurements of the cosmic microwave background. You had very precise measurements of the hydrogen helium. You know, there's something at this point, what, like 10 different lines of evidence that build shore up the Big Bang. Many of those were in play, I'm sure, by by 2001. So I wonder what kept him holding on to the theory for so long. He was, he was very, very stubborn. And uh, he held on to ideas, some ideas that were pretty ridiculous for a really long time. For example, he had this idea that all life came from outer space now instead of Earth, that, mm -hmm. that Earth wasn't old enough for life to evolve. Well, some people object to that because that's anti-Darwinian. And in fact, he was recruited by creationists, ironically, to try to justify uh, their anti-Darwinism. And it was really ironic because he wasn't religious at all. In fact, he, he sort of eschewed religion and, and uh, also believed that the universe was eternal. 
<laughs> so it was it was a little bit ridiculous. But anyway, um, even more ridiculous is he said that all diseases came from outer space in the form of co comets and that they would rain down on Earth during uh, solar cycles and things like that with no evidence for it. So he was stubborn to try to cling on to these fringe ideas. And, and of course, by, by the 1980s, 1990s, um, opposing the Big Bang Theory, opposing the idea of a hot early universe was really on the fringe. Now, what I think he should have done was embrace the idea of eternal inflation, which is the idea that the universe is eternal, but you have these seeds in this vast eternal space, the infinite space that become big bangs through quantum fluctuations. And that you have this something like a bubble bath and you have these bubble universes and one of the bubble universes is ours, but then you might have other bubble universes out there. And that's a little bit like the steady state theory because you have an e the possibility of an eternal universe the possibility of local creation sites. But Hoyle didn't like that idea because he only liked things that are imminently testable, that you, that you can that you can kind of test immediately. But isn't I mean, isn't eternal inflation one of the necessary implications of the theory of inflation itself? Like you can't have one without the without the other. And I think what Guth had come up with inflation back in the 70s. So he had lots of time to to mull that one over. And I think at this point now there are some uh some some tantalizing evidence of inflation. Yeah, so there's there's evidence for inflation. There are opposing views, such as the idea by Paul Steinhardt and Neil Torek of of cosmic cycles, which uh which when I was researching the book, I looked into whether or not Hoyle knew about that. And the preprint for that came out before Hoyle died, but it's unclear if he ever read it. So, but he definitely knew about the idea of the universe accelerating its expansion. And he even wrote a paper about that, trying to fit it into quasi steady state. So a lot of the stuff they we think of as contemporary cosmology, like the accelerating universe, Hoyle was around to see. So because a lot of the big cosmological discoveries came in the in the 1990s and 1980s and 1990s um there was a i think I, I think i'm right on this there was a um uh a probe someone's proposing to build a spacecraft based on gamov's name the gamov explorer something like that but essentially a gamma ray observatory to try and perceive the first stars in the universe as well as other gamma radiation so i'm sure yeah, he would he would have enjoyed the pun on his name because he he loved puns. George Gamow was a real prankster and a punster. And uh, he, one of the papers he published on stellar, nu uh, sorry, Big Bang nucleosynthesis was with his student, Ralph Alpher. And he added Hans Bethe's name to the paper just so he could make a play on words with the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, because the names were Alpher, Beta and Gamov. <laughs> and Ralph Alpher was very upset until the end of his life about that because it was mainly his work. It was his PhD thesis work. And not only did he have to share credit with his advisor, but then with a third person who had nothing to do with the paper. So it really was what watered down <laughs> the credit. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so I mean, it's funny, like when you read this story and all of the players involved, I mean, not just these two that we've been talking about, but Eddington and Einstein and Rutherford and all of these incredible names and and the amazing contributions that they made. How do you think that relates to where we are now in modern times with the modern pace of cosmology and development is you know, is it just because we're living it day by day that it doesn't feel as fast paced and as exciting as it did a hundred years ago? Well, I think objectively, there were a lot of discoveries a hundred years ago and a hundred starting maybe about 120 years ago and then to about um, 190 years ago. Science was very, very fast paced, especially in terms of fundamental science, fundamental research, because if you think about it in uh, 1900, we didn't even know that there were galaxies outside of the Milky Way. And there was some speculation about that. 
but it wasn't shown until definitively until 1929 with Hubble's uh, discovery of galaxies moving away from Mars, the recession of galaxies, um, uh, which was based on other people's evidence that um, people started to say, hey, the universe is expanding and there are, you know, many, many galaxies, myriad galaxies beyond ours and the Milky Way is only a small portion of the universe. So that was really remarkable. But in fundamental physics, uh, quantum physics, atomic physics, nuclear physics, particle physics, there were so many discoveries from 1900 to the 1930s. And then it sort of trailed off until, you know, the 1960s, there were still, and 1970s, there were still particles being discovered. But the pace for fundamental physics is, is certainly not as rapid today. And um, although there are a lot of discoveries in areas such as condensed matter physics, biophysics, and then um, in astrophysics and cosmology, uh, things like, and they're going to talk about this later, exoplanets, that's pretty remarkable. Um, you know, the last um, 20, 25 years, that is an amazing revolution that we know about all these planets outside of the solar system. Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of the experimenters. I think I, I tend to, to cheer on the experimenters and the, the observers first. Um, and it definitely feels in the, in the exoplanet world that the, the observers are just having the field day. They're just, they're just running the whole field at this point to torture a sports analogy. Um, while the theorists have just got so much data to try and catch up and try and figure out what's good. They don't, even, they don't even have time. Like it's just too much going on. It's incredible. The thousands and thousands of planets that have been discovered and the tens of thousands that are going to probably be disgorged in the next few decades from all these new observatories going up. It's kind of oh, yeah. mind blowing to reimagine our place in this universe. Yeah. I'm so excited about the web telescope launch and, uh, that's going to be incredible and and to be able to look at atmospheres of other planets and search for life it's uh it's amazing so and i'm sure um going back to my book i'm sure both hoyle and gamov they were really interested in the search for life and the understanding of life as well as the understanding of cosmology and material in the universe so i think they would have been really excited by the launch and really anxious to see if there's life elsewhere yeah, yeah, it's a, it's it's such an important question. It's possibly one of the most important questions that humanity can ask: is Are we alone in the universe? And now we finally have the tools. We have, we have a robot on Mars with a microscope, and it's collecting samples. We have a mission on the way to Europa in a couple of years. It's going to be scanning the plumes for evidence of ice, for evidence of life. We have. James Webb, as you say, and others coming online that could detect biosignatures, not to mention all of the SETI work that's being done. So it's a it's a pretty special time for this expect, you know, this investigation into this question. And I should mention that Fred Hoyle was not only an expert scientist, he also wrote some very popular science fiction. And he was really interested in the question of life elsewhere and all the varieties of life elsewhere. He pictured uh, in the book The Black Cloud, life being this this molecular cloud that somehow is emergent and produces life. And in his um, his TV series that he wrote the screenplay for, A for Andromeda, he imagined um, signals being sent from, from outer space um, with the code to produce a, a living creature on Earth, to be able to reassemble an alien on Earth named Andromeda. And that that's pretty remarkable too. Yeah, don't run that code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's a trap um well paul thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today your book flashes of creation i read it really enjoyed it highly recommend it um what now what are you working on next well um, i've you know when i finish a book sometimes i take a break and write articles i have an article about something called mox principle which was something that baffled Einstein trying to pr prove why things in space move at a constant speed unless a force is acting on them. So that's going to appear in a, an Italian journal, even though it's an English language uh, article. And I'm working on an article 
uh, or a book chapter about the work of John Wheeler. So I, I'm keeping myself busy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if people want to find out more about what you're working on, where should they go? What's the best place to keep track? Well, first of all, I'm very active on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at P, my first initial, Halpern, my last name. So follow me on Twitter if you're interested in my work or go to phalpern.com or just Google my name. And uh, there's all sorts of things uh, that I've written and uh, videos and so forth about my work. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Paul. And uh, and good luck with the uh, with the book. I hope a lot of people enjoy it and are able to to watch this incredible debate because it was a lot of fun to read. Thank you so much for having me on Weekly Space Hangout. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Let's move on with the space news of the week. Wow. We're this is an interesting new layout. Um, OK, I got to answer this question. Fifth Dimension is asking uh are there more or nifty is asking are there more galaxies than atoms in a grain of sand so i actually did the math at one point so there are more stars than there are grains of sand in all the beaches of the earth so that's the key is that it's it's that it's stars and it's grains of sand on the beach and so if you include all the deserts then it doesn't then the math doesn't hold but if you add up all the stars as they were atoms, they would be about the size of a sugar cube in the observable universe. So if all the stars were atoms, they would be the size of a sugar cube. Um, all right. So let's get on with the news. All right. I Sorry, got some... in the universe or in the galaxy? In the observable universe, the number oh, wow. of stars is the same number of atoms in about the size of about a sugar cube. <laughs> but that's my math. And I'm a computer scientist. So, all right. Uh, let's get on. Okay, Nick, you got a bunch of stories. So I'm going to start with you. Let's talk about uh, water on Mars. This is brand new. We've never heard about water on Mars before. No, no one's ever published a title with that name before. Yeah. No, this is actually a pretty neat discovery. Um, so this is coming from, uh, I believe it's pronounced the friend instrument, even though it's missing the eye. Uh, it's the Fine Resolution uh, Epithermal Neutron Detector, which is part of the Trace Gas Observatory, or TGO, which is part of the uh, joint ESA Roscosmos um, ExoMars program. All of that. So this detection is in a portion of the Valles Marineris called the Candor Chasma, which is that little northern portion uh, up above the main channel. Uh, so that's surprisingly equatorial. Um, now, the preliminary numbers that are coming out is saying there's up to about 40 weight percent water in the upper meter of soil. Whoa. Wait, that is wait, a lot on. of water. So, the, like, if you scooped up a chunk of candor chasma and separated 40 it, 40% of it would be 40 water. 40% of it would be water. And that's near the equator of Mars. And, and that's near the equator of Mars. And it's at a lower. Uh, elevation, which means that the yep. air is probably thicker. Plus, you've got some. It's nice also near valley walls, which means near valley walls, which is I was going as, as well. Yeah, this just sounds incredible. Yep. Huh. How does yeah. It, hey, wait, how do they make this terrestrial soil? Oh, go ahead, Alan. I was wondering, how does that compare to terrestrial soil? I mean, that's a lot. That is a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't actually know the terrestrial numbers for anything similar to this. But my imagination immediately goes to something like permafrost, where you've got actual mm. layers of ice that are interbedded with the soil. And we're just talking the first meter. Uh, the detection can't go any further down than that. And there are several caveats that need to be more rigorously evaluated to really try to evaluate how solid is this conclusion. Because you'll notice the first thing I said was up to 40%. It could be a lower number than that. 40% is just the upper limit for that. We know it's not more than that, but we also haven't done this looking at um, other energies of neutrons. There's not just a thermal, there's other spectra of neutrons for lack of a better term. Uh, I'm not a neutron expert, so please don't poke too hard at that. But you're a Mars um, expert, so you're half I am a Mars guy. Yeah. Um, they also, uh, a lot of the modeling that they're using for this is fairly simplistic in terms of how to interpret the data that they've got back. So there's some more caveats that need to be done to refine this number. But if it bears out and there's a significant quantity of water, it doesn't have to be anywhere near 40%. It 
I mean, if there's 10% water on the equator of Mars in a nice deep location like this, yeah. it's well protected. That's every science fiction author's dream come true. Yeah. That's saying, all right, Musk, we know exactly where in this, where to send spaceship <laughs> once you get the thing working. Yeah. That is that is kind of amazing. What would it take to find out more? Honestly, um, more study and someone that's much more familiar with this kind of instrumentation than me. Well, I guess My the question is, proof? is there a limit to what you can do from Earth? Like I'm like I'm thinking about the discovery of water with the Sophia instrument on the moon. And they were able mm -hmm. to scan the moon in infrared. They were able to detect the presence. I mean, they already knew they had the presence of hydrogen and oxygen coming up, but they weren't sure whether it was was OH or H2O. And, and to be and fair, able... here we don't know that either. We also right. don't know if it's pure ice or minerally bound or in interlayers in clay or what. All we know is it's about this much hydrogen. And by the time you're up around 40%, the only thing that really makes sense is pure ice. Right. But yeah, how would we confirm this better? Well, we could keep going with more and more precise orbital measurements, trying to work out more detail of what's going on and try to get more context for the geology. But my favorite solution to all of this is send something to the ground, mm -hmm. dig into a meter of the soil, pull it out and say, is there ice on that? I mean, you think about like if the there polar is, lander. Like that was the perfect machine, but it was in the poles, but it had a big scoop on it and was able to, to dig around yeah. and, and see what it could find. Um, <clears throat> you've got the Chinese Rover, uh, yeah. with, uh, with a ground penetrating radar system. Yep. That would do the trick. Uh, there's also a GPR, sorry, ground penetrating radar, uh, on perseverance as I recall. Uh, so we're really starting to get into looking at the subsurface. Um, and, and one of the instruments the, that kind of. And did the Europeans with the Mars Express, they announced the discovery of water like fairly deep below, like a lake of water under the surface of, of Mars. Yeah, that was using a radar measurement looking at the southern polar cap uh, and uh, discovering a return of radar that's really only consistent with the salty brine uh, that was sitting underneath the cap. Yeah. Um, there's also been a geomorphological study that looked at uh, Utopia and Planitia. This is uh, within the Great Northern Basin near uh, that uh, small, smaller set of volcanoes, still huge, but small compared to Tharsis, um, where there's uh, evidence of what looks like um, permafrost that's been reworked in the area. So you get these unique kind of scoop shapes uh, from uh, ice sublimating and uh, changing the morphology of the ground. Uh, so there's a lot of different detections, but they're not usually this close to the equator, nor potentially yeah. this much water. It's, it is interesting, though, again, like the the discoveries of water at some point under the surface is has been made further and further away, like towards the equator, farther and farther away yeah. from the poles. That there is some kind of vast under the surface reserves of ice, maybe a couple of meters thick, maybe a couple of meters down, you know, well beyond, say, the I don't know what they call it, the Arctic Circle. I don't know what you call that region on Mars anyway, <laughs> but but at you know towards the equator and it feels like there's kind of water everywhere on mars I, there was another story i don't know if you saw the story today i don't know if you even queued this up let me just make sure no you didn't okay good um <laughs> so so like the, the agu is happening so there's been a pile of of oh, geophysical yes. press releases coming out in the last couple of days and so one idea is that the water is mixed in with with water bearing clays and that's mm -hmm. where the water went is that it's just been sucked away from basically the sucked of up like a giant geologic sponge yeah yeah and so yeah that's an away idea that's been bandied flight. about a few different times if i recall um and it's one way to stabilize water is to stick it in what we call the interlayer of clay uh clay is this neat silicate structure and one portion of it uh for what we call expanding clays can just stick an almost arbitrary amount of water in it and it just makes the clay expand a little bit and when you sort of add on top this 
this idea that we're finding volatiles in other places, probably volatiles under the surface of Phobos. There's probably volatiles inside some of these asteroids like Ryugu and Mercury appears to be volatile rich. Yeah, yeah exactly. we're finding volatiles we're finding everywhere. Them on the moon. That that originally the idea was that the inner solar system was bone dry and you know? that if you wanted to bring hydrogen, you needed to bring it from Earth. And now mm -hmm. it really feels like there's there's water in acceptable quantities almost <laughs> everywhere we need it, which is really exciting. Water, water for, everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And to drink. So uh, amazing Hopefully. news. Yeah, I saw this this press release today and I just it was at my jaw. Dry. It was amazing. One of the most incredible discoveries I've seen in a long time. Yeah, Fantastic. I'm really hoping this one bears out to yeah. more scrutiny. But yeah. it's super exciting. Just the thought that there could be water there yes. is really, really neat. Yeah. And mind absolutely. you, this is a totally different line of evidence than people that have argued for water in the Valles Marineris based off of um, rills in the canyon wall and uh, other geomorphic features. So this is a totally different way of looking at that. Yeah. So cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, Alan, what do you got? Yes, so uh, I think my headline's slightly misleading. Uh, it is a giant planet, exoplanet, uh, B Centaurus, B Centauri B, um, big super Jupiter discovered a little while ago, um, about ten Jupiter masses, which isn't that's all that special. It's big, you know, but uh, but it also orbits a B class star, which is between six and ten time ten solar masses. Uh, at a distance of about 550 AU, which is 14 times, if my maths are right, uh, the average distance of Pluto from the sun. So it's big planet, very big star, very big distance. And I believe this sets the record for the largest star found to have an exoplanet. And this was reported quite a bit in the last week or two uh, in the general press about um, impossible planets overturning all theories, blah, 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 which is a bit silly, I think. It's not impossible. It's there. We can see it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's quite an interesting story behind the discovery. You know, there's, um, there wasn't, uh, hadn't been a lot of um, studies observing uh, stars this, this massive because our standard models say I shouldn't say standard model. It sounds like the standard model. Uh, our general models uh, say that um, they, they shouldn't be able to form planets. You know, they, they, they're so hot, they're so active, uh, they stellar winds and their radiation pressure should strip away all that dust and gas from the protoplanetary disk before planets can form. But a study called the, uh, what does it stand for? The acronym is BEAST. It's the B star uh, Exoplanets Abundance Study. Uh, that's, that's funny. We that's a great at naming objects, a, but we great a, at naming projects. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful <laughs> backronym. Mm. So they were using direct imaging to look for exoplanets around these B stars, which haven't been studied, uh, at least that I'm aware of. Um, and looking at stars in the uh, Centaurus Scorpius um, Young Star Association. And they have found a few, but this one uh, identified in 2000 uh, using the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. Um, it's an interesting method they use. They just take pictures of these very bright stars and look for anything really, really, really faint. And <laughs> they look at the color. Uh, if, it's, if, you know, if it's got a lot of near-infrared, then they know it's, it's too cool to be a star. It must be, could be a planet. And if the proper motion matches, then that's a candidate. And then come back a few years later and observe again and and, and then verify it, it's interesting and, though when they like you know they always talk about how difficult it is to observe say uh, planets around sun like stars that you you know you've got to do like you've got to dim the brightness of the star by a billion billion times yeah. with a coronagraph ideally multiple coronagraphs to try and dim the light of the star and yet they're finding planets around incredibly bright stars like i'm sure it's more than a billion billion times mm. having to reduce the the light but i guess in this case the star is so bright and the, and the planet is so far away that they were able to do this direct imaging and very large so the planet is quite bright um i think it's 0. 0.0001 the brightness which is still a huge difference mm. yeah but not a billion billions planets 
Yeah, and the Stoic method seems to be biased now towards these large bright planets at very large distances as compared to the radial velocity, which is the opposite. You know, it, it's objects very close to small stars, uh, you know, because that allows for a, a more obvious wobble that you can detect. Uh, where was I? Sorry, let me get my notes open. Uh, yeah, so they, they discovered this, um, and it, it does raise the question, you know, how can a star like this form a planets at all? And the understanding seems to be, the idea is that that protoplanetary disk will have to evaporate just from the, you know, just the pressure from the star itself, but that has to happen from the inside out. So it's pushing it away from the star. So a very large star presumably comes from a very large protostellar uh, cloud, nebula, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the outer regions, there's still time for these planets to form. And because it's such a large star, and this is a trend that's already been observed, large stars tend to have larger planets. Um, that would explain why this thing is so big and uh, why it's why it's so far away. And of course, there could be smaller things that have migrated inwards and there could be smaller things out there as well, but you're less likely to detect them with this method. Now the star is, or sorry, the star is part of a binary pair and the planet yeah. is orbiting. I, I didn't see whether it's orbiting both of them or whether both the stars and the planet are orbiting the, the large star, but I it's wonder a very, if, very close binary. Yeah. I it's wonder. Okay. So this, yeah. right. Okay. So the, the stars are orbiting around each other really closely. And then the planet is far out orbiting both of them. It's orbiting I the system, wonder yeah. if, having this close binary did something to protect the planets, help focus mm -hmm. the accretion disk, something like that, as opposed to if it was a singleton star. Hmm, that'd be an interesting idea. Yeah. I mean, I, with my not a PhD, uh, wouldn't think so. <laughs> How do I want to ask a real expert that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm uh, curious and... to know if this is coming close to a snow line for this system. Uh, and you know that's some of why this planet is so so large. If I recall, it's formed quite far outside the snow line, which was another one of the challenges uh, to the to, hmm. to the theory. They it's uh, five fifty AU. Now I'm really stretching. Yeah, it's five fifty yeah, AU. Far. So that is like that's the distance right. that people are hoping to build a telescope in the solar system to use the sun as a gravitational lens is 550 AU. I mean, when you think about Pluto is 48, 30, 30 AU, 30 AU, 49 AU. AU. Yeah. Is that's really far away <laughs> from the, from the star. Yeah. Even Sorry, a bright star a like couple that, orders of magnitude. Yeah. Even a bright yeah. star like that is going to have a snow line much closer than much, 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 AU. much, much closer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I wonder how long fascinating. that would take that planet to go around those stars. Oh, Tens of thousands of years. <clears throat> Hundreds you know, of thousands they actually, of years. Yeah. They found previous images that had just been discarded before. Uh, a 2000 survey captured it, but it was so faint that it was huh. just, um, it was ignored. It was assumed to be just a bit of, you know, electrical, electronic noise in the image. Um, but that gave them an extra 20 years of orbital data to oh, be able to that's really cool. work out. Yeah. So they know it's, it's a very low eccentricity orbit. It's almost circular and it's, um, it's inclined at around very, I mean, very roughly plus minus 15 or 20 or something, uh, 45 degrees inclined to our view. So not edge on and not flats, you know, but somewhere along those lines. Uh, I, I I love when people are using the direct imaging technique to be able to actually find planets as opposed to the radio velocity and the transit because you have to have them perfectly lined up. Like you've got to have planet, star, and they got to be lined up, Earth, right? Everything's got to be lined up. You only get like 1% of planets are actually in that configuration. The rest are going to be a little above, a little below, or, you know, or the whole thing is face on. And and the and it's going to take like the vast number of planets out there it's only going to be direct imaging is going to be the only way re really for us to be able to perceive them at all 
And it's it's interesting to me that I mean they found this. It's kind of interesting to me that more haven't turned up so far. Mm. Because what I love about direct imaging is that you know when I, when I was when I was a kid when I was a teenager in the nineties, um, and reading my sky and telescopes, and everyone was talking about the detection of of, of exoplanets was this distant possible technological poss possibility. And then late nineties they found the first few, but direct imaging, no, no, that's pure science fiction. That <laughs> will, that's impossible. Yeah, it yeah, be yeah. Done. Will it? Well, here we are. <laughs> yeah, well, here we are. Yeah, that, that, I mean, there's a there's a video that I love to show when I'm doing talks of from the very large telescope of a planetary system in infrared. So it's newly forming, but you can see multiple planets orbiting around this star, and you're just like, that is a real <laughs> picture. Those are really planets. You can watch them change over time. That's where we're at, and. I mean, the best telescopes are coming online in the next couple of years. By 2026, we'll have the extremely large telescope, which will just bury the VLT in terms of capability. So the best but is yet to how, come. I love how this image that's on screen right now, this is the VLT, and it looks like an overprocessed amateur image that I'm overtaken. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. that, that's how faint this is. This is our... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most powerful yeah. telescope in the, in the world. Four telescopes. That's how small we one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Incredible, mm. though. All right, Nick, you got another story for us. I do. So this was a study uh, that was looking at, um, well, a, a returned lunar sample, something from the Apollo 17 mission. Uh, it's lunar troctolite. Oh, goodness. What was the number again? Um, lunar troctolite 76535. Um, this is a rock that is made up of olivine and uh, calcic plagioclase, uh, something we call anorthite. Uh, and we think it came from kind of the mid to lower crust of the moon, but it was found on the surface, so it would have been excavated by an impact. It's basically unshocked, which is not common for a lunar sample, uh, especially for a lunar meteorite, but this one is so by people. So, what does shocked mean? Oh, sorry. Um, so during impacts, rocks get shocked. What's going on is that uh, the impactor hits the ground so hard, it sets off a shock wave. Um, mm. Shock wave is different from something like uh, a seismic wave uh, or an acoustic wave, uh, where there's a little bit of information coming along beforehand, then the wave hits, and then there's a tail off. But the shock wave, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, everything is happening. <laughs> <laughs> right okay and so Sorry, this, terms. yeah no that's great great so this sample um had been shocked or had not been shocked had not been shocked yeah it's unusual for the moon because most of what's on the surface of the moon has experienced quite a few impacts and every impact is a chance to have a shock wave go through the sample and to form the mineral structures which re removes some of the geologic information from those minerals so they looked very the researchers looked very carefully at some of the minerals and looked at some what we call mineral chemical zoning. So if you don't know what mineral chemical zoning is, don't worry. Uh, it probably just means you're not a geochemist. Um, what's going on in mineral forms, it doesn't all form in the same composition most of the time. So if you've got a glass of ice water and you freeze that glass, well you get a big ice cube, right? Well what happens if it's salt water? If you have a glass of salt water, the first little bit of ice that forms out of that is going to be a little bit fresher than the water it came from, which means that the remaining water is now a little bit saltier than it was mm. before. Yeah. So the next little bit of ice is going to be a little saltier than the first bit, and so on and so forth, and you'll end up with this everlasting gobstopper <laughs> where the middle is fresh and the outside is salty. Wow. That's mineral I didn't know chemical that. zoning. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah, okay. It really works, too. Um, so. It turns out, though, if you heat a sample for a long period of time, if you keep a rock at a nice hot temperature, it will iron out this chemical zoning. It will even out over time, a lot like ironing wrinkles out of a shirt, which I clearly have no experience with. Um, well, if you know which elements you're looking at and what mineral they're in, 
you can see what kind of zoning is left and get a maximum bound for how long that sample's been heated up for. And what was really cool in this analysis is they looked at the very slow moving element and found that it still had igneous zoning in it, which put a bound that the sample could have been heated for no more than 20 million years. Okay. Well, here's where that initial context I talked about comes into play. This is from the mid to lower crust of the moon. This is 20 to 40 kilometers inside, which means it had to be cool within 20 million years. Previously, we talked about the moon being hot and volcanically active mm -hmm. for about 100 million. This sample now says that couldn't have happened and just mm -hmm. knocked off 80% of our timeline for how long the moon was really hot for. So when you say really hot, like, are we talking like a ball of molten rock or are you talking? No, about actually, we're like talking the next stage after that, after you've already got a bunch of solids that have formed. So you've got like a, like so, a, a surface, but it's still quite volcanically active. Like, is, would this have been yes. when the various mare all formed? Yeah. Uh, so this is pushing back the timeline of the moon and saying it had to be a lot shorter than we thought before. Hmm. Now, there's a few caveats to this. The first one is this is one rock, and we're trying to infer an entire celestial body's context off of that one rock. That said, it's a pretty well positioned rock to make that kind of analysis. So, this is really kind of kicking the can in the community and saying, well, we've now got evidence that everything happened a lot faster than we thought it did before. How does this make sense? That's really interesting. So is there is there an answer? <laughs> Do we know? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, this is a fresh headline. Um, if I remember right, it came out um, within the last week or so. So I wonder uh, if the Chinese sample return has some rocks that will be able to corroborate this. That's a really good question. And we'll only know with time. Yeah. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I love seeing, though, because this is you know, the kind of work I love, where you're looking at really fine details in a rock, and it's giving you just these little pieces of information that, if you're clever, you can relate back to a whole context for an entire body and mm -hmm. change everyone's mind. It's yeah, also a just... great argument for why we need to bring more rocks back from places. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, as if we needed more. Like, if you had a, a, like a nonstop line of rocks coming back to earth i'm sure the the geochemists and scientists would be able to uh work with them no problem they've, they've i no would be shortage. throwing a nice big party and <laughs> celebrating what my field could do yeah exactly fantastic all right uh we've reached the end of our time here so now is the time when we uh shamelessly self-promote what we're working on so uh nick your last speak what are you working on and where can people find out more I am preparing for a class that I'm going to be teaching this January called How to Live on Mars and Not Die. Right. You can find more information on Eventbrite. Uh, just look for How to Live on Mars and Not Die. Um, oh, so, so apparently the thing that we're seeing on our screen, Nick, is what the people in the audience are seeing. So for some reason, your screen technicolored. Only is going technicolor. Yeah, you are being... Uh, Miguel, uh, I can't Angel explain Romero it. Said, yeah, well, it's funny because I'm seeing the preview of you down below and you look perfectly fine. Uh, yeah. a wrinkly shirt, maybe, but perfectly fine. <laughs> uh, and so it's so the so the so clearly the camera on his side is fine. It's somehow with the so Pamela, I'm not sure what's going on here, but it's pretty weird. Um, awesome. Rendezvous doesn't like me, it kicks me <laughs> off at least once per session, but so he doesn't he doesn't look. He looks fine to me down at the bottom. Does he look fine to you down at the bottom too, Alan? Yep. Looks yeah. Fine. Yeah. No, he looks perfectly fine. So there's some filter that's being applied somewhere uh, to Nick's image. Mm. Anyway, uh, thank you for <laughs> thank you for adding a festive pink coloration to to this week's episode. <laughs> this is a color we never Always used. Always happy to apply. Yeah, uh, Alan, uh, where uh, what are you working on? Where can people find out more? Okay, so Urban Astronomer Podcast is live after more than a year of empty promises. Uh, we've got new episodes out and so new episodes coming. Um, you can find that, I suppose the easiest place is just go to urban-astronomer.com or you can just search on whatever 
platform we use. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at you astronomer. There, he's back. Congratulations on on not pod fading. Alan, that's, that's yeah. good, good, good work. Um, all right. So, of course, I'm university and all things. I've got an interview tomorrow uh, with a researcher with the NEID, which is a planet hunting uh, telescope. So I'm going to be I'll be queuing that up tomorrow. But they're they've essentially been staring at the sun. It's, a, it's an Earth based observatory instrument. Uh, I think it's attached to the McDonald Observatory, Lowell Observatory. Anyway, um, but it does use the radio velocity method. And in theory, it'll be powerful enough to discover Earth-sized worlds orbiting sun-like stars using the radial velocity method from the ground. But they're uh, sort of in the initial phases where they're calibrating it. And it's quite exciting. And uh, so I'm going to be talking to her tomorrow. I'll put that into my schedule and so people can check that out i got a bunch of great interviews coming very quickly I, I don't all the way through the holidays so enjoy all right thank you everyone for joining us today both on youtube and on twitch thank you to our special guests thanks to my co-hosts thanks to nancy graziano and all the moderators keeping everything organized nancy was working uh double time again today thank you pamela for engineering behind the scenes both turning Nick Pink and restoring him to his <laughs> to his more natural color. Um, we will see uh, all of you next week, right? We've got another show next week. Yes. Yep. Okay. I'm on it again. <laughs> again. Nick's back. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Four everyone. Weeks in a row. We'll see you next week. We'll see Nick next week. Sounds <laughs> great. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you.